And so I'm so delighted to be able to host this uh, event with my dear friend um, and colleague, Iwan Kun. Um, she's the best. But we all know that. <laughs> um, the Asia Art Archive, we, um, you all know, I mean, most of you uh, should know, if you don't know about Asia Art Archive, and most of you in Hong Kong do know about Asia Art Archive, we are co-organizing, co-teaching this um, class on Hong Kong Art History with you one that we've been doing for... We've done three iterations. Three iterations. Obviously, the pandemic has come in the middle of it, so it's extended over a longer period of time, but... Um, that's what it is, and we feel uh, very, very strong, and I'm speaking from Asia Art Archive's side, that this has been one of the most productive, most interesting, most informative, most instructional, most mind-bending um, parts of what our, our ongoing pro program is in. So we are very, very privileged, again, to be um, uh, co-teaching with Iwan, but um, collaborating with Hong Kong University. I'm a Hong Kong University PhD. I'm so proud. <laughs> I'm so proud. Um, and um, so I feel this. This is a little bit of a family family reunion today. Um, Age Art Archive in Hong Kong, as I said, you all know, was founded in 2000. Um, that we call Age Art Archive our mothership. We always introduce uh, our kind of group of organizations. Uh, that way, Age Art Archive is our mothership. It's where we started. It's where we have the largest collection of books. It's where we um, have, it's our center of gravity in uh, many ways. And then um, in addition to that, um, we have an uh, office in Delhi, as some of you know. And we have this office that started in 2009. Um, we, as you can see, it's, it's, in some ways it's similar. In some ways it's very different than Hong Kong. We have um, reference books. Monographs uh, um, and uh, periodicals, uh, exhibition catalogs. We also have a vast dig access to the HR archives, vast digital um, archive through our through our intranet. So we're considered an uh, on-site access only location. So if you want to do further research into our digital archives, our primary research, you can come here to do that. Um, and we also do programs, tons of programs. Hi, hi. So nice to see you. Um, uh, we do lots of digital, um, lots of uh, programs of all different sites. Different so we're again, this is one of those programs. Um, okay, so I'm going to hand it over to Elon. Um People are going to trickle in, and um, I hope that's okay. But I think we have a, a critical, a critical mass now. <laughs> Thank you all for for joining this, and it's it's just thrilling, and I can't wait to hear more about it. Thanks. Uh, so just to go back a little bit, thank you, Jane, for the introduction. Uh, very generous introduction. So we've been collaborating, I've been collaborating with AA for this particular project. And I just want to give a bit of background to how, why it happened and what we're trying to do in the future. So it all started really with a workshop that AA did about teaching Hong Kong art history. And at that time, I wasn't teaching Hong Kong art history. I was there just as a participant. And one of the comments that kept coming up, or some of the comments that kept coming up, was how difficult it was to teach Hong Kong art history. Unless you were an insider, it was very difficult to access information. And in some ways, it was almost too difficult to teach because there's no standard text. There, may, there are several different texts. It's written in Chinese and in English. But it was very difficult to pull them together. And it was very difficult to keep, because um, it kept changing all the time. And it was very difficult to kind of keep up with the pace of the changes. So one of the projects uh, that actually really developed during COVID was the idea of maybe we need a timeline, so an easy entrance point for people to actually just know where to start to understand a sort of history of Hong Kong and the history of Hong Kong art history together and take them in. So working with, at that time, with Michelle Wong, who was at AAA, and then later with Anthony Jung, who is the researcher, some of you have met him, uh, we started to develop this particular project. Can you help me? So this is, I just want to show this. This is the time map. So this is me talking to, and there were two other people, Yi Ting Li and um, Nicole, who was also very, this is designed by Nicole. And this is kind of our conversations. How do we design something which can address a lot of these things, yet uh, kind of advance, to not do a linear timeline that just suggests a progress uh, an advancement sort of story, but something that can embrace a lot of these different sectors of Hong Kong history. So 
we this is our we did a first edition and we workshopped it and it did and one of the feedbacks or two of the feedbacks we got was that they wanted it to be more searchable so that you can type in keywords and then you can find out what's happening and then they also wanted a greater overview of um, various timescales. So we redesigned it and this is the one that we're currently working on. Can you just scroll down at the book? This is still sorry, so you can just scroll back up. So eventually what will happen is that you will click on to, you can click on 1980s for me. This will come up and then you will have a basic introduction and then there'll be a list of different things and you can just scroll down of all the things that were happening in Hong Kong in the 1980s that were important. You can also see that at the very top, um, you can see we've got these different art organization, education grants, you can click onto those and those will also be a way of giving you the whole history of that throughout time or you can do individual searches. So the idea of this is that it becomes a much more easy entry point for people to use. So we are hoping that we to launch this later on. I should say that a lot of the information that we have that goes into this website are actually taken from the student projects that you are hearing. So there are a lot of, we've got about 400 entries at this moment in time, um, and we are adding to those, um, and with each of the entries, if you can scroll down again. Um, so for example, it isn't all coming out. So if you were to just click on, say, Zuni, let's see if that works. does it work? You will get some of these. It will give you ideas of the website. Uh, with some of them, there'll be more information in terms of what kind of bibliography you can go to. So it is, like I said, uh, an entrance point, um, an entry point for people to kind of get into Hong Kong art histories. And we'll give bibliography. The one thing we haven't done, and, we, and I'm still thinking about this, is do we add artist names? Because in some way that adds, uh, and if we did artist names, where we would put them? Would we put them when they were most active? Would we put them when, when they were born? Um, so at this moment, we're sort of leaving out artist names, and it's really just more about some of the key exhibitions that may have been crucial in the development of um, certain directions in art. Uh, for example, Out of Context was a really important exhibition that led to a lot of performance art. And so we put those things in. So the idea of what we include and what we don't include has been actually a really interesting process for us in thinking what are the things that we can or should include and what don't we don't include. Um, part of this development of this particular project is also um, at, at some level a fear of um, histories being erased at this moment in time. So we actually want to try and put as much as we can. And we're thinking about how can we protect some of the information as well, whether we need to uh, blockchain some of this so those are some of the things we're still working with so by no means this is a complete project but we hope to keep on developing it over the years and at the moment I'm the gatekeeper of the information but I'm also hoping to work with others who would like to to join us in this this enterprise or take over from what I'm doing so at this moment it's still early stages and we hope to launch it slightly a slightly more um, complete version by the end of this year. At the moment, we've got some funding from Hong Kong U who's supporting us doing this. Um, but we're working on the back end of things. It's really much more about the technology of stuff. But the information we are slowly building. So hopefully this will be launched and other people can access it. So that's the point of all of this. Um, it is, like I said, uh, uh, a starting point for anyone inside Hong Kong and outside of Hong Kong to get knowledge about Hong Kong art history. So with that in mind and the importance of how we are relying at this moment on the students providing, so we've got this major principal timeline, but we also have the students doing these, what I call time capsule projects, um, looking at smaller micro uh, way of thinking about some of the things that's been happening um, in Hong Kong. So that's what the panels of what to this morning is going to be about. So let me talk a little about what the structure is going to be. In our first panel, we're gonna have three speakers or three different, um, uh, papers, they're going to be about 10 paper, 10 minutes long. Just a brief overview of some of the things that they've been doing. And then we'll have a little Q&A Q at the end of that um, and a quick break uh, during which you can take a look at some of the archives. We borrowed some archives from um, Asia Art Archive in Hong Kong. So you can take a look at some of the materials that the, uh, the students have been working with and actually the materials we've been using a lot for this particular website at this every own Asia Art Archive immensely for the kind of wealth research that they have so that we can fill in a lot of these missing gaps as well. Um, so 
please do take a look at some of the things. There's some great information there available during the break. And then we come back and then we do the next panel, which in the second panel will be much more about individual practices. And then again, a and a So that's kind of the structure today. So I'm gonna step aside and I'm gonna pass it on to our first speaker, which is Kaida, who's working on Hong Kong's early commercial art markets, 1950s to 1980s. So let me pass it on to Kaida. Okay, great. So I'll just get started then. As Dr. King mentioned, um, my project is exploring Hong Kong's early commercial art market from the 1950s through to the 1980s. Um, so in short, my project examines this network of early commercial art galleries that have emerged um, from the 1950s through to the 80s. And with this, I was hoping to gain an understanding of how these individuals and institutions helped shape that understanding or a certain idea of Hong Kong art. Um, you know, today when I think of Hong Kong's art market, I imagine a highly competitive, highly lucrative um, landscape that exists today. So I was really interested in taking a look at what might have foregrounded this and what, have my, what might have helped shape um, this reputation as uh, a major commercial art market center. And so because I spent some time on this, I'll just briefly touch on it. But this was essentially the starting point of my research. And what it is, is a cluster graph consisting of over 200 data points and their subsequent relationships with each other. Um, and so it includes information about galleries, which are the red points that you can see there that are highlighted. Um, gallerists, the artists that the galleries have represented, um, where they were active, where they operated, and a few other things. Um, so I'll just look at this example of Alice on Fine Arts. Um, and so you can see here that I've included um, the artists that they had exhibited and represented, um, the gallerists, um, like the leadership of Sandra Walters and Alice King, um, where they were active in Central, for example, in this case, and uh, when they were active, so Alison had opened in 1981, and it's still in operation today. Um, yeah. And yeah, this is just a chronological timeline of the openings of the galleries I focused on. Um, unfortunately, I don't really have enough time to talk about every single gallery, but this kind of gives you an idea of when things were opening and what galleries in specific were really relevant to this time and really relevant to the creation of an art market, a commercial art market in specific. And so from the information that I had accumulated in doing research for the initial cluster graph, there were really three main things that I thought were the most fascinating um, ideas and areas that kind of presented themselves. And this was the commercial boot or the gallery boom that kind of happened in the 70s, um, the significant of the expatriate community in the development of the market, and how certain galleries helped shape a specific um, perception of Hong Kong art. But before I elaborate on those points, I'll just briefly go over um, the beginnings of the gallery scene because I think it is such a milestone in the history of art in Hong Kong. And so prior to the establishment of formal, formal, formal art galleries, artists took to more public institutions to showcase and sell their work. So this included the, um, the halls of the St. John's Cathedral and the City Museum and Art Gallery. And so here that they could host these like short selling exhibits that really only lasted a few days. Um, but this kind of changed on November 4th, 1962, when the South China Morning Post had run this story um, titled Colonies Have Its First Art Gallery. And this really signaled the inauguration of the city's first commercial art gallery, which was China Galleries. And so this was, of course, founded in November of 1962 by Dorothy Swan, who was an American school teacher. And she was really interested in creating a space where artists could present um, longer running solo shows than, that, than those that they were presenting at St. John's and the City Gallery, or City Museum. And she realized that artists kind of lacked this infrastructure to um, exhibit more permanently and to, and she really sought to assist in the promotion of local artists following the inaugural, uh, sorry, there was an actual inaugural show at the City Hall Art Gallery called Hong Kong Art Today, and so after seeing that, she had been inspired to start this gallery because she was interested in where those artists um, could take their careers at following that. Um, and so not only is Chatham represent, recognized for the fact that it was Hong Kong's first commercial gallery, but it's also credited for its integral role in the development of some of Hong Kong's most well-known artists' careers. So for example, um, it's recognized as the first space to have held a one-man exhibition of 
country funds oil paintings, and it's known to have continually supported his practice and having hosted at least, like, I think, four solo exhibits of the artist's work over its four-year run. And so after Chatham Galleries had closed in 1966 due to a lack of tourism revenue that they had relied on um, caused by some of the adverse effects of the Kowloon riots, um, there was this, once again, like a large gap within the city's art market. And so with this, a new sort of like cohort of galleries were ushered in and kind of seized this opportunity to once again establish a gallery scene. So from 1972 to 1960, 1976, there were five localized galleries and one international auction house that emerged within the city. And so the first of this was Ai Chuan Gallery in 1972, and then came Arts Promotion Gallery Dumont, Quorum Gallery, and the last of this kind of group was Figure Four Gallery. Um, and so within this period of about four years, there was this sort of boom in a sense, and there was a more rapid development in, um, than what we saw in the 60s. And so despite the nascent nature of the gallery scene, some critics were already becoming wary of this rapid development um, and already started to express some apprehension towards this, some of the hyper-commercializing tendency, tendencies of certain galleries. So um, in a review by Nigel Cameron on Li Ching Man's painting exhibit at Forum Galleries, he wrote, um, Hong Kong is Hong Kong, a commercial place, yet I would hope that the gentle art of putting together an exhibition as opposed to merely uh, hanging up pictures for sale without vanish. And so within this article, he had expressed some of the disappointment and some of the curatorial practices um, of the directors. And he also noted that there was like this issue of overcrowding the galleries um, because some of the galleries um, seemed to be more interested in um, the sale of the works rather than um, like a <coughs> deliberate, careful curatorial practice. And so the next thing that I started to notice when I was looking at the biographies of some of the gallery directors is that it became clear that there were many members of the expat community who had open um, galleries and were acting as gallery directors at this time. So of course there was a large British community within Hong Kong due to the colonial rule, but there were also a number of French and American um, born citizens living in Hong Kong at the time. And so when these galleries arrived in Hong Kong, they of course brought their American and European sensibilities and really helped introduce Western art to Hong Kong. Um, so for example, reflecting on the gallery's first uh, David Hockney show that Fred Scholl, the founder of Gallery Dumont, um, wrote, when we first opened in 1974, we were showing works by American and European artists, but didn't do a show, solo show because what we were doing was very new to Hong Kong at the time. There weren't galleries showing Western art. And so this is what he had said about the, um, the gallery when it first opened, but after a few years in the business, he also goes on to say in this article that he gained a strong um, understanding of what his collector's interests were. And he, there were actually, collectors were becoming, starting to become interested in Western and American art. And he really helped foster this demand for American and European art. Um, and a similar thing goes for Sandra Walters and her work with art, arts promotion and her ushering in of European prints, graphics, and photography. And so expats also served as important patrons of art during this time, um, a lot of, because many of them possessed like, the means to purchase art. Um, and a lot of the early audiences of these, specifically expat-run galleries, tended to be other expatriates, so like friends and family of the galleries who were kind of exhibiting. But yeah, um, aside from Sandra Walters, maybe because she was so prolific, expats aren't really included in the narrative of Hong Kong art. Um, but I think within this particular area of the art world, it becomes kind of like an important perspective, um, especially when considering how the landscape resonates, continues, to, or the early landscape continues to resonate in the market today, um, with this very global, highly international crowd. And um, this group and demographic of galleries really for granted that and helped bring in a different idea of what Hong Kong art is and help foster um, the sense of interculturality that is profound in Hong Kong. Um, and so the last thing that I wanted to touch on was how certain gallerists and galleries had helped shape a perception of Hong Kong art. And so um, Daphne King, <laughs> who's here, um, 
in an interview I had done with her, mentioned at the time that it wasn't really in the DNA of Hong Kong people to buy art, and people were much more interested in purchasing antiquities and luxury fashion. And because most people were only really knowledgeable about art at this time, um, there had to be a lot of work done to convince people to purchase and support contemporary art in Hong Kong. And so despite a lack of awareness, um, Alice King and Sandra Walters in their work with Alice Saran um, really understood this as an opportunity to educate and create a demand. And in doing so, um, they explicitly worked with artists to create a strong sense of who and like what they were representing. Um, and so that they could imagine this future direction of the gallery, the market, and really art in Hong Kong. And so Alice Saran was particularly instrumental in bringing in a new understanding of Hong Kong art. And Alice King was deliberate in her work in shaping a new perspective of what Chinese and Hong Kong art is. And so this is really evident in um, Alice King's vehement promotion of New Ink Art, which was now really widely understood as a movement that really represents Hong Kong art. Um, sorry. Um, yeah, and at the time when Alice Song was beginning to work with um, Lao Xiao Kuan and other New Ink artists, the term New Ink Art really wasn't being used. Um, and so, I'm not sure if Alice herself had actually uh, coined the term, but it's, there's no doubt that her persistence and um, promotion and marketing of it as such really helped shape its identity as well as a broader identity of Hong Kong art. Um, and so, <laughs> in this clip, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> um, um, in this clip, um, Daphne begins to explain um, her mother's motivation for her work in promoting Chinese contemporary art and new ink art. So I'll just play it here if you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, I think I have to turn this off. Reason that our gallery started focusing more on that, or my mother started focusing more on that, was more of a response to what was then happening if we do the next decade in the 90s, um, where things were coming out of China that were much more like the political pulp movements with the big bouts of dome and um, a lot more politicized artwork of the environment. And, and those artists were also starting to work with on um, medium. And so I think it was a slight reaction to that saying, wait a minute, there's so much more in China and the cultural heritage, working you know, in ink, in rice paper, um, that's, she wanted to showcase that part of, of contemporary art versus what a lot of the West were seeing, um, you know, the politicized artwork, yes. So that, in terms of the new you know, that we were showing was, was response to that, I think. Yeah, and so to reiterate what Daphne had said, Alice kind of found this idea narrative of Chinese art to be very limiting and sought to offer an alternative perspective. And so Alice Song had hosted the first exhibit to show mainland, art, mainland Chinese artists in Hong Kong in 1987, and it was titled A, of, A State of Transition, Contemporary Painting from Shanghai. But yeah. Um, and so, of course, this is just kind of to visualize um, the sort of chain of events that really helped, that related um, some of the early galleries to our current understanding of Hong Kong art. So, of course, by supporting certain artists and um, offering them representation and exposure through solo shows and group exhibitions, art, certain artists became locally and internationally recognized and now are really synonymous with what Hong Kong art is today. So, for example, that could be um, new, new Ink Art um, with Alison or the Soko Art Group, which was promoted by um, Chatham in its early years and other many of the early galleries. Um, but yeah, that kind of concludes my presentation. <laughs> to come up. Um, they're going to be talking about Oil Street to Capital Depot um, and, and yet another very important institution, a change of institution in Hong Kong as well. So over to you guys. <laughs> uh, good morning everyone. And I'm Wei and this is Claire. Uh, we're glad to share with you our, our project on Hong Kong Artists and Village, Oil Street to Capital Depot. And we have some booklets around the area, and feel free to take one with them. We have over 20 copies, I think. 
And also there were three albums from Barkins uh, capture some very interesting moments of all history. So feel free to have a look afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> and so let's start. Um, in 1998, the government supplies department on Old Street hosted an advertisement uh, for a cheap lease of their vacant buildings. The, this advertisement immediately attracted a group of artists to move in and started their life and creations on Old Street, which later became a very influential cultural space in Hong Kong. In 1999, the tenants um, of Oil Street received an announcement from the government property agency asking them to move out. So the artists tried to extend the leasing contract but failed in the end. The authorities still maintained their ori original decision, evicted the artists, and relocated them to a slaughterhouse uh, in Mat Hawaii, uh, now known as the Cattle Depot Artist Village. The shoplift Oil Street Artist Village became not only a utopia for the artists, but also a collective memory imprinting, imprinted in the public. By investigating the turbulent state of the artist villages, the instability of land policy, and the voices of various parties at that time, this project aims to establish a more comprehensive capital of this very first Hong Kong Artist Village. We visualized a timeline starting from 1998, uh, when the Asian financial crisis swept the world, to 2013, when the new project at Old Street was established. As you can see on the screen, this general timeline marks the major events that happened at Old Street, such as the announcement of the short fees on Old Street, and artists moving and moving out. Here, we formatted each event with a label by year, month, and date. If the exact date is unavailable, we're, uh, it will be left by the vertical. Following this label, you will find a detailed explanation in the following section. Here is just a sample of the uh, notes with further descriptions of the events. Later, you can uh, explore this in the booklet. And through the timeline, we have four major chapters chronologically telling the story of Oil Street. Chapter A is the vibrance of Oil Street, B is Safe Oil Street Campaign, C is after moving to Cattle Depot, and D is about land policy changes. And Claire will start on uh, with the first two chapters. So in the first chapter of uh, Violence of Oil Street, we're really zooming into these two years of Oil Street and how successful it was, and uh, entirely autonomy artist village by the artists and with some limited um, control by the government. Um, within this limited time, there were over 200 exhibitions. It's really hard to imagine like we, we have some exhibition here. And we listed some um, ten lists of tenants and then some facts on the space here. And interestingly, this section will be com can be read comparatively with chapter C after moving to Cattle Depot, which has a similar structure. And in this page, artist impression of the Oil Street. AA Hong Kong actually, actually have done a project on Oil Street before too, and then which is extremely helpful for us. And this page is um, oil, the Oil Street tenants drawing of the impression of Oil Street during the previous AA event. In this section, we're truly trying to resemble the vibrance and how wonderful the memory, public memories were. And in the chapter B, it's about a safe oil street campaign, and it's a campaign artists gathered and petitioned to the government to extend the lease of the oil street artist village. During this period, from various sources, we can see that um, artists were trying really hard to approach to many governments, and then um, most interestingly, on this first page, um, they, they wrote to the chief executive town of Hong Kong. And then he was invited to the exhibition to open this door of the artwork by the James Wong, but he didn't come in the end, so the door <laughs> remained closed. Yeah, in, in, in this section, um, we divided SOS campaign into five stages, followed by the structure provided by AA previously, into how the strategy originated and formed, and then to how they reached to various government and the newspaper to increase their influence, and then how they put, uh, so we put many um, newspapers at snap here. And then in the end, um, how last they negotiated to move to Cattle Depot. 
Uh, and in May uh, 2021, the artists gradually moved, moved to the Capital Depot. With some artists choosing to go elsewhere, there were fewer tenants in Capital Depot. We also have this list of tenants in 2001, here which is shorter than the list of tenants in Oil Street. Here is a signage, uh, in the it is a signage of Capital Depot listing the tenants they have for now, the 2023, uh, which are around 12 units. Uh, it also marks that uh, several units are still open for shop leases right now. Uh, and this is a photo taken in April when Claire and I visited the Cattle Depot. Uh, here, the next is, uh, here's just uh, some photos for of uh, Frog King student in Cattle Depot today, because yesterday Anthony mentioned Frog King, so we want to show uh, his studio. And yeah, yeah, and it's quite very messy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's just so obvious to me. I know this. Um, yeah. <coughs> and we also visualize the space prohibitions of Cattle Depot at that time. Compared to Oil Street, there are apparently more prohibitions. For example, artists cannot paint on the wall, and visitors were not allowed to take photos, and etc. Also, there were three different authorities at that time that were all responsible for managing the space, so actually led to a chaos in the management. So, um, and in the uh, chapter D, land policy changes, uh, this chapter looks back to the site of the Oil Street and what happened after the artists moved out. Since the artists moved out in 2000, the site has undergone various twists and turns. The land department rejected the application to sell the site of Oil Street three times, and it was eventually sold in 2011. And two years later, in 2013, uh, the project oil was officially established at 12 Oil Street, formerly the Royal Hong Kong uh, Yankee Club, which is not the original site of the Oil Street Artist Village. We reconstructed these two diagrams of the locations of Oil Street Artist Village and oil. So you can see uh, the original site is here, and then the black, uh, yeah, the black box is the formal Royal Yankee Club, and now it becomes the new project of oil. So the original site becomes to ho the ho uh, hotel zone now. <laughs> yeah. And moreover, uh, in handbook, uh, we also parallel the timelines of Oil Street Office Village and the new project Oil to nuance the differences between these two projects. So the difficulty we faced in this project are that the whole set of events that happened in 1988 to 2000, and the information is extremely scattered. So there are various of source of information that indicates different results and doesn't really match with each other. So <laughs> in the end, eventually, um, even the OYO, which is the new site, under currently based in the former Yacht Club of, uh, of Hong Kong, even though publicly they don't talk about the association with the old Oil Street Artist Village, but still the research we can see that there's a lot of confusion and big of understanding online. So what we have done is trying to cite the, all the sources with um, each of them, and then the people who are interested in this can dive into the research through this collective structure we provided. And we collected information from books and then um, Hong Kong visual art yearbooks done by Chinese University of Hong Kong, a newspaper and some re reports and a box of documents provided by an artist from Oil Street to um, Asia Ar Archive in Hong Kong. And this, bo this that box is primary, um, primary material which contains many photos there. So um, we also brought three of the albums which we guys can send through later. And then through this very scattered piece of the information, we try to take out the mainstream of the, um, and then formulate them into a clear line of information and then categorize them into a more readable way. And in the final section um, of the handbook, we document various comments on Artist Village of Hong Kong from uh, several artists, researchers, uh, critiques, and writers. Um, the complexity of the Oil Street Artist Village lies in the fact that it became part of the social and public culture of Hong Kong at the time. Through this booklet, we aim to reproduce the turbulent, unstable, and fragile visual culture and showcase the important chapters of Hong Kong's art, art history that are gradually fading away. The rise of the Oil Street Artist Village resulted from the combination of government policies 
uh, the social historical context and maybe some luck. Hopefully, this handbook can provide a picture and information about Oil Street and get more people to know the once thriving artist village in Hong Kong. There's a lot more information in there, including the citations that uh, Wei and Claire were talking about from people. I just want to cite this one. James Wong is the head of Save Oil Street. He advocated for the preservation of Oil Street and its development into an international art village. He expressed his opinion stating, and this is his quote, the cattle depot is meant for cows. It lacks the opportunity to host large-scale exhibitions. The presence of gas drums and noise from the nearby highway would degrade the artist's village. And the, uh, an available area is much smaller compared to Oil Street. So that was one of the responses um, by some of the people in the Save the Oil Street campaign. And there's a lot more of that information there. So this booklet is actually free for anyone. You guys can just pick it up later on. And there's some photographs of Oil Street and it's over there. So thank you. Our Tanway project is entitled Long Journey of Baking and Plus. After over two decades of debates, and plus, the first global museum of contemporary digital culture in Asia finally opened to the public on November 12, 2021. However, its journey of establishment is far from being smooth. With a history dating back to 1996, and plus construction is entangled with government policies, local politics, social critiques, and public involvement. By examining the key milestones, setbacks, and breakthroughs encountered throughout the long journey of baking and plus, our project aims to shed light on the institution's visions, values, and contributions to Hong Kong's art ecology. So to achieve our goal, we drew, we drew on a range of primary sources, including first-hand hard copies, media documents from official websites, as well as public commentaries in local newspapers. And these sources are collected in our project book, which are available there and are free for everyone to read. Yeah, we're so collecting them. You guys can take a look as well. Yeah, so yeah. the first half of the book crafts a chronological timeline of M plus based on official documents while the second half collects newspaper critiques that act as sparkling explosions, disrupting the authoritative narratives and making the time being more sensible, visible, and perceivable. So based on the materials gathered, our timeline covers three main sub-periods. The first sub-period, 1996 to 2006, raised the ambiguous plan of the West Helmut Cultural District. It laid a crucial foundation for the idea of M+, and the issue focus on visual culture. The second sub-period, 2007 to 2014, involved increased public engagement and further promoted M plus construction, including developments of its architectural design and collection policies. For the third period, 2015 to 2021, witnessed the physical construction and systemization of M plus during precarious, precarious years of political agitation. So in our presentation, we will mainly focus on the two sub-periods, um, providing possible narratives for M plus development of visual culture and its collection policy. Thank you. So um, I will discuss about the first sub-period, um, which is few people know and talk about. It's from 1996 to 2006. Um, our detail, uh, the detail of this timeline is in the book. Uh, I will just give some basic uh, important points. So. Um, the idea of developing a cultural hub of art and culture in Hong Kong was long before the establishment of M Plus. It was first raised in the Tourism Report of 1996 and the 1998 Policy Address of the Chief Executive at the time detailed building a museum cluster incorporating museums with wireless themes of the rice colon reclamation. So, when deciding the themes of the museums, four preferred themes appeared namely modern art, ink, design, and living image. So the theme of modern art followed the, uh, the, the trend at that time. Well, ink was uh, the distinctive feature of Chinese and Hong Kong culture, of course, and living image catered to the long-established and vibrant few culture in Hong Kong. And the design is aimed for nurturing local artists and also uh, designers. So with the four preferred themes, in April 2006, 
The government formed a museum advisory group to assess the feasibility of the proposed four museum things and explore additional things. So Jane was one of the members of this group. And um, the group held a series of public consultations seeking public advice, namely one focus group meeting, two open uh, consultative forum, and three presentation hearings, and also meeting with overseas museum experts and conducting museum visits worldwide. For attendees of these consultations, we, not, we may not have time to show them, but we do have documents recorded attendees. So meanwhile, um, the Museum Advisory Group also collected 66 pieces for other potential museum stamps, including common ones such as the Museum of Photography or Museum of Textiles, and also interesting ones such, such as Museum of Cantal Pop, of Childhood Memories, or even about Chinese medicine and herbs. So, the consultation collected various opinions, and within them, a suggestion stands out, saying that it would be better to have one big metropolitan type of museum with different things, rather than have separate museums. So in re response, the Museum Advisory Group ultimately reached a broad and ambitious conclusion, and plus with its same visual culture. So for the reason of having visual culture, they contend that it embraces most areas of interest raised during the consultation, and within the 66 potential themes, 80% of them relate to visual culture. So they didn't mention the criteria to judge whether the theme's relationship to visual culture. So it is also a fluid concept, exploring new aspects and responding to the ever-changing circumstances. And for the name M+, Plus, it means museum and more, which is meant to be an open-ended format, encouraging dialogues and that delivers ideas, activities, education, entertainment. So, um, after releasing the concept of visual culture and M+, yeah. we could see some interesting interactions between yeah. criticizing voices and also the response in newspapers, um, as having a museum of visual culture was something that never happened before. So here are two examples, uh, which was published slightly after the issue of the Museum Adversary Group report. One criticizing voice said that the flexibility stressed by the group will lead to a lack of clear direction for future development. Well, the other uh, was raised by MNG member Oscar Ho. It, it's what, it was more optimistic. So um, with the explosion of information in the 21st century, the boundaries between art, design, classical, and popular are no longer important. What's important is the way of looking at things and organizing them, limiting planning for exhibitions. So um, this could also relate to the complicated nature of visual culture itself. Uh, including what should and should not be included in visual culture, how to categorize it. And these are still questions raising discussion nowadays. So with all these expectations and concerns, we came to the second sub-period. So after the idea of it plus and its focus on visual culture came up, in June 2007, the consultative committee finalized a recommendation report on the West Helen Culture District, which was released to the public in September with subsequent public engagement exercise lasting for three months. So according to Polly Hughes' analysis of this public use, the consultative committee generally gained strong support. However, uh, according to its qualitative data analysis, it also listed some negative points related with M+. Plus. And I think critics, in public uh, uh, critics and public comments in newspapers compensate for that Polly Hughes' analysis. So in this presentation, we will mainly focus on the diachronic discussion of M plus collection policy, an essential element that contributes to its mission of visual culture. So as early as 2007, there is a newspaper entitled M plus or M minus criticizing <laughs> M plus lack of clear mapping of collection policies. And that piece provides there is a general skepticism about whether M plus could use one billion Hong Kong dollars to by all those collections. Despite the fervent public responses over the years, the authority remained silent in M plus collection strategy, merely vaguely introducing them into paragraphs of 2006 reports. Yet, the turning point came in June 2012, with the West Calvin Culture District Authority's approval of M plus first acquisition policy, and the Swiss collector Ulysses donation of his vast collections of contemporary Chinese art to M+. And the, this again triggered heated social controversies 
ranging from radical comments such as West Kowloon betrays Hong Kong to worries about whether local artists can find their way, uh, can find can survive, and to supporting tones considering this collection's finally find their way home. Fading these social commentaries, Six's response is that I have repeatedly expressed in public my readiness to bring my collection back to one day to China. Yet, having never received any signal of interest from public institutions in mainland China, except for employees which reached out its hand. Okay, so um, for conclusion, looking back on the history of M Plus before 2006, so the idea of having M Plus in visual culture was not an overnight idea, but a result of collective thoughts, and to some extent, it is a compromise of different interest holders for it could be hard to summarize opinions from all of them. Thus, the importance of having visual culture is more about showing globalness, localness, and also inclusiveness. And M plus in visual culture may not be the most ideal like them, we could say, but it's the most comprehensive thing that could in include almost everything existing, as well as anything that could be included in the future, maybe. This may partially explain why its collection policy is so broadly and generally defined at the beginning. It is perhaps this very flexibility and inclusiveness, also and plus intention for pointing out social issues in the hope of solving them, that contributed to the mutual choice between the sick collection and M plus. So above is our thoughts when tracing back to the history of M plus, but how M plus is going to reflect on social issues in the more and more tense political and social circumstances is also the question for Amplus nowadays, more in the maybe coming future. Thank you. So the next session is really focusing much more on individual practices of artists, um, and also looking at magazines and other things as well. So kind of shift the focus away from institutions to different kind of projects. So we're going to start with John, who's going to be looking at mag art magazines in the 90s. So sorry, over to you, John. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm John. So um, what I'm going to do today is um, I'm going to look at like three magazines um, th um, that were um, published in the 90s to the early 2000s and uh, I'm going to show you like um, just uh, some some of the interesting things that I found in the magazines and uh, yeah just just some of the just basically highlighting some of the relationships between some of the themes and and uh, and the artists in them so um, yeah let me just start with some basic information about my magazine so like um, my first magazine is this location, um, otherwise known as Nuna Um It ran from 1992 to 1999. The main editors were Li Ka Sing, Holly Lee, and Lao Ching Ping. It was a bilingual publication published as a supplement to the photo pictorial magazine. So from 92 to 95, it was published at monthly intervals, but from 96 to 99, it was published at biannual intervals. So during the first phase, um, each issue only had about 16 pages, but then there were more pages during the second phase. The magazine received government funding for one year from 1998 to 1999. Before that, the magazine had certain issues that were sponsored, but um, the main source of funding is unclear for the most part. Uh, after the government funding ceased in 1999, the magazine was also terminated. My second magazine is The Art in Hong Kong. It's a bi-monthly publication in Chinese. The editors were Lo Kun Chiu, Wong Xiao Ching, and King Chia Lun. The magazine ran from October 2000 to August 2001, which means only six issues were published before the magazine was terminated. Each issue was priced at um, 30 Hong Kong dollars, but the magazine also re received government subsidies while it lasted. The reason for its abrupt and quick termination is unclear, possibly related to the government cutting their funds, much like what happened to the Dislocation magazine. But there's a related story about this, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. And as for my third magazine, it's going to be the Parasite magazine. It was a bilingual publication um, produced at irregular intervals. It began in 1997 and ended in 2006 for a total of 27 issues and two special issues. The first 13 were um, published with the month of the publication, while the latter ones um, abandoned the specific month and uh, used the season instead. Um, you can still read um, these issues online for free um, today at the PS official site. 
But back then, you can obtain the, the free copies at certain venues in Hong Kong, but you are encouraged to subscribe to them, to support them. And uh, subscription is certainly necessary for readers living outside of Hong Kong. The magazine was also funded by patronage, advertisements, and the government. So, okay, so um, here are the front covers of 12, the 12 issues of the Dislocation magazine in 1994. So when we look at that, um, we see that there isn't really anything that um, permeates through them, except for the, the, the name at the top, in the bar. And here we have all six of the Arts in Hong Kong magazines. The top row is the front cover, the bottom row is the back cover. And we can see that um, they look similar to what we just saw. But um, if we, okay, we can, we can look at this one as well. This one is PX Magazine. But if we open up uh, what is inside, we can see that um, actually, okay, the bottom left corner one is the Art in Hong Kong Magazine. The top left one is the Dislocation Magazine. And the uh, bottom right one is the PS Magazine. So I just took some random pages out of each of the magazine and um, they show that um, even though uh, they look similar on the outside, the Art in Hong Kong magazine has a much more, you know, textbook-like um, um, visuals inside. And uh, the other two are more creative in how they use their magazine space. So um, what I want to show here is that even the magazine itself, they're not only like showcasing contents, they themselves are contributing to some of the visual culture. Okay. So let me move on to the custom map. This is the main character of my presentation here. So here, um, okay, we've got um, about uh, a little over 60 notes here. It's not that many, but um, I want to show with this custom map how the magazines um, interacted uh, with each other through the artists and through the topics that they covered as well as through the medium. So um, the blue dots are the artists that I found to have appeared in more than at least two of uh, magazines. So, for example, Liu Shouquin here, um, he appeared in Art in Hong Kong magazine as well as the PS magazine. So I put him here. Um, for some artists who didn't manage to appear in all, like appear in two more more than two, for example, um, Luke right here or um, some other artists like Toder Pack. Um, they didn't manage to appear on my custom map right here. So why did I choose to do this? Is because like I want to see like what sort of artists will manage to make their presence um, in different uh, on the different magazines. So um, we can see that um, right here we've got um, some names that we might recognize here, uh, maybe um, Christina Chu or maybe Stephen Pang. So yeah, um, these these. Uh, individuals they appeared in Art in Hong Kong and PS Magazine and on the other side we've got some some of the names that we recognize as well that appeared in this location in PS Magazine. There are five artists that appeared in all three and uh, they are I'm sorry I need to refer back to here. <laughs> yes um, yeah there are five that appeared in all three but um, I just need to um, I'll return to this so um, yeah and uh, yeah, anyways, I, I want to show some like interesting things here. So, um, firstly, um, it, for me, it's quite interesting that Art in Hong Kong featured 24 overlapping artists. It, regard, even though like it only ran for 10 months, 12 months, like it depends on how you see it. So, because like of the small scope, it really tells us how Art in Hong Kong is a magazine that aims to show a very diverse landscape in Hong Kong. And here is Sonia Zhang. Sonia Zhang is the daughter of Keith Zhang, some of you may know. And uh, she was, show, she was um, attributed in this location and PS Magazine explicitly, like um, her name is on there. And I found it interesting because the first time that she made her appearance, is in 1999 in an, in, uh, in an issue of the Dislocation magazine. Um, she was born in 1993, so at 1999 she was only about six years old. So um, she has a work in like Dislocation and she has her name at the back of, of the book. So it is a very official thing and uh, really breaks our like stereotype when we think of an artist at least 
like we would think they are at least like graduated, like from high school, right? <laughs> But then like we have a we have a little child here, so it really tells us that everybody can make art. <laughs> they may not be artists, but everybody can make art. So yeah, the other thing is that um, like some downsides to my graph is that it's not indicative of how important um, each of the figures on my graph is. So don't um, really take it for face value. Um, Right, I want to show this one first because it goes back to what I just said about not indicative. So, um, um, Wu Shis Wong, um, very famous artist, um, ink artist, um, a master, but um, uh, in art in Hong Kong, like he really is a master. Art in Hong Kong, like shows us how he did his ink art, what what the importance was. But in the PS PS um, magazine. I found this um, passing remark on him. So right here, literally says, Wu Shi Wong continues writing his overview in quotations of ink in Hong Kong. Although it's nothing new, it's still still a statement of the school. So it's like a backhanded compliment right there. It's a statement of the school of the new ink movement, but it's nothing new. So like this tells me that. Okay, so like the mainstream artists are really like di diverse into two groups. One group that really appreciates um, what Wu Shis Wong is doing, and the other who thinks that we, we should move on and do something else instead. So yeah, um, there are a lot of these passing remarks um, in in the magazines, um, but I still like put the names in there because I feel like if you if you found like yourself on a magazine, I mean you are prominent to some degree. So I feel like I felt like putting. These names up there, even though they aren't featured artists, they are just like getting like passing mentions. But um, I feel putting them on there will really like enhance our understanding of what the landscape was back then. And yeah, let's go back to the the medium and topics. Yeah, I found like the the common medium between art in Hong Kong, um, this location, and PS to be such. Um, photography and graphic design is something that all three of them have. And uh, you see, like this location is a like special magazine. It only does photography. Sometimes it has graphic design, but like in the in all of the 16 page issues, it only does photography. Like they're, they 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 um, ask for artists to to take pictures of things that fit in the theme with uh, with the, with that issue. For example, there's a sound issue. Like sound, you would expect them to do something related with sound. They did. They did it with their cameras. So um, art in Hong Kong goes beyond this um, this pool and um, looks at architecture, sculpture, and installation as well. And PS goes even further and looks at performance, poetry, and film. And um, we we see that art in Hong Kong has like um, they they didn't really have the chance to justify themselves or they they really weren't that into the more progressive forms of media and we're going to look at that in, in a sec and some of the common topics that all three cover are interviews commentary exhibitions and reviews so i just want to bring us to this article right here i found it very interesting it's the only news article that i could find that was about art in hong kong the magazine so this article was written by Keith Sum, very prominent um, PS magazine writer. Every issue you will see him. So um, here he criticizes the art in Hong Kong magazine on issues that are mainly focused around um, the scope being too narrow or um, the, the lazy um, edit editorial work that, 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 that was happening at the art in Hong Kong. So. Um, yeah, here are the main points. Um, I'm. I don't think I should read them out, but um, <laughs> no, I, I'm serious. Like, um, like there there are a bunch of like issues there, but I'm gonna elaborate a bit. So the failure to recognize the correlations between art and daily life. Um, he he meant that um, the arts in Hong Kong they focus on like very small and narrow um, medium like sculpture, paintings, and installations. And uh, Keith believes that he, that doing so is not um, allowing people to correlate art with their daily lives. 
And then limiting Hong Kong by geography, he is pointing out that art in Hong Kong was um, ignoring a lot of artists who aren't physically within the, the boundary of the geography of Hong Kong, but they also identify with the Hong Kong identity. And promotion of, in quotes, fine arts, going against the original intentions. By original intentions, he refers to the, the intentions um, brought forward by Dr. Ho Chi Peng, the, the head of HADC at the time, which is to promote art to the younger generation. And he said that if you're promoting fine arts, then um, you're really doing such a, a, a um, posh thing, like it's very not uh, friendly with people who want to get into art. And then he also talks about the editorial issues. Lazy editorial work, he refers to how um, when he read the art in Hong Kong magazines, he found that all sorts of articles were in there, like there is no, like it, it's all complete chaos. And the lack of editorial statement, he says that because of this chaos and because you don't have an editorial statement, I have no clue what you're doing. Like, that, that's, that's his words. And the laughable article quality, um, he quoted a passage that he found in an issue that he found to be um, um, utterly hilarious that um, somebody of the journalist um, sector would, would um, use these, these forms of like very emotional or very um, energetic words to write a journalist piece. Okay, anyways, like limitations of Chinese monolingual magazine, like um, you, you can't really promote to anybody other than Chinese. So yeah, I wanna, uh, what I want to say is that um, that piece of article right there gives us a very good idea by contradiction of what we aren't supposed to do with a magazine to, in order to understand what people actually wanted to see at the time. That's my conclusion. Thank you. We're going to move on and it's going to be Nicole. Elaine could join us, but uh, Nicole, they've been looking at what did the artists do in order to survive? <laughs> Hi everyone, so I'm Nicole, and today I'm going to do a presentation on my project, which is the shifting occupations of Hong Kong artists. Okay, so uh, let me talk, walk you through our, the rationale of our project. So actually, we, uh, why do we want to do our project? So because we want to challenge the idea that profession in arts cannot make hands meet. Because um, people in the past, like uh, Gaylord Chen's father, actually um, disapproved his son to do to pursue a, a career in arts because they think that uh, such a profession cannot make a living. And we want to challenge this idea. And also, we want to explore how artists' background will influence their work, so that we can examine uh, the multiple identities and artists possess at the same time. And then we can also inspect the relationships and connections between artists over the years. Also, this is a simplified version of our first draft of our major timeline. For our major timeline, you can just um, head over there and look at it. It is on an A0 a, a zero paper. So in our timeline, we have uh, nine artists, and we uh, divided them into three groups. So for the first group of artists, they are born before 1950, and then we, and we included Lo Xiao Fan, Ha Ge Chun, and Gay Lao Chen. And then for the period two artists, uh, they are all born in the period of 19, 1950 to 1960, and we included um, Lo Zhang Guan, Alan Powell, and Oscar Ho. And for the last period, uh, period three, we have included uh, Luke Sheng, who is here, and then we have um, a Sao Zhou Fai and Kong Tae as well. They are all born uh, in uh, 1970 and 1980. And then, so how do we present our information? As I have just mentioned, um, I have a A4 paper, uh, a, I mean, A0 paper over there. And then um, I have a little, like, uh, uh, A4 booklet um, around there. Okay. Yeah, 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 this one. Yeah. Yeah. So this A4 booklet is actually uh, uh, an overview of what we have done. So um, I can pass it around. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. And then. So in our April booklet, uh, we have first of all our, all the statements stating what are what are the aims of our project, and then we have included our research method. And um, for each of this, we have a period of view, and we have uh, occupation timeline, artistic activity, 
timeline and institutional support timeline. So what do these timeline mean? So for occupation, obviously anything that generates income. And for artistic activities, we actually include the participation in arts groups, exhibition, either solo or a group, either in Hong Kong or overseas. And we also included the publications that, that they have published over the years and the, the exhibitions that they have curated. And uh, for lastly, uh, we have institutional support timeline, which includes the, uh, the awards, grants, residencies, and commissions they have, the artists have received over the years. So, in, uh, <laughs> so we have uh, done uh, two interviews one with uh, Kong Dan Hei and one with Luke Cheng. So thank you for like, uh, <laughs> please accepting my interviews, <laughs> invitation. And so in our interview, we talked about a lot of things, really a lot of things. But uh, mainly we focus on the uh, education and career. So for education, we want to know how the education in foreign arts actually influence them. Because both of uh, both artists that we uh, we have interviewed uh, studied at the university uh, at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, and they all studied in the fine in fine arts. And we want to know what they have like what support they have from the lecturers. And for the uh, career part, we want to know more about their recent work and I, uh, we want to know more about how do they find their work interesting and enjoyable for them and uh, what are the criteria that for them to choose their work. So for Luke, the, uh, so how did he try, uh, choose his work is that um, he uh, finds the lowest paid jobs and he go for them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And then, so for our second research method, we did some research at the archive, at, at, uh, in the Asian Arts Archive Hong Kong, and we have looked at read through the books, uh, and we have also like looked in the physical archive, like um, here, yeah, here we can see this is actually uh, a work by Dr. Zhang Fei, and then uh, we have here an, in the, uh, an exhibition uh, interview, uh, an exhibition leaflet. So actually, uh, we have looked into a lot of things to extract the original information. And the, another research method is that we uh, look for online sources, uh, mainly from artists' website and galleries' websites. And then, so actually, what did we do? So here is a uh, is an example of what we have done. So we have used uh, Gayla Chen as an example. So in period one, first we start with a period overview, and in our period overview on the left hand side here, you can actually see what did the Hong Kong artists at that time think about the Hong Kong art landscape. So uh, we have included in period one, we have included the comments of Gan Bai Tan and Bu Zi Yong. And then uh, also, we, in order to provide you with a more comprehensive view of the whole Hong Kong um, socio-economic situation. So we have included uh, an overview of Hong Kong's working population by sector. So like which, uh, like how many people are working in the treasury industry, primary industry, and secondary industry. Okay, then let's move on to the occupation timeline. So as we can see here, uh, uh, before um, Gui Lao Chen is actually uh, becomes an artist, he was a uh, special advisor at the Eastern Telegraph Company, and then uh, yeah, so and then he works as a submarine uh, communi communications cable project, which actually basically just um, uh, is actually delivering like uh, information and in uh, providing internet services. Yeah, and then. Uh, for the, his artistic activities, because there are a lot, so we only select uh, some of them to be put here. But we, as you can see, he actually founded the Artmesh group, and he um, and he also published a book. Yeah. And for the institutional support, so uh, he actually received an MBE from the British uh, uh, from the British Col uh, uh, colonial Hong Kong government. And then in 2013, he actually got a Bohemian star, bronze Bohemian star from HKSAR government as well. Okay, so what are uh, <laughs> 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 so 
Um, in each of the uh, three periods, we have done a little little uh, conclusion. So, um, you know, for the for the artists in period one, they um, we found that they seldom directly pursue a career in arts because they want to make a living at that time, and they uh, spend a really large proportion of their life on doing so. And then, and then, so and the period two artists. And then they have parallel occupations. Why do I say that? Because um, so for for example, Ellen Pao, Ellen Pao is actually uh, as she is still is a mammographer and radiographer at um, uh, Queen Mary uh, Hospital at, in Hong Kong. And then while she works on her like uh, video pro uh, digital projects, and then she uh, and then for uh, artists. Um, these artists not only focus on their own work, but also they focus on education as well. They have um, like greater advocacy on education, and they uh, and most of them, like some of them, teaches at the uh, Chinese University of Hong Kong. And then we see that the uh, edu educational opportunities actually shifted from personal connections to more inter ins uh, institutional level. And then for period three artists, we have more diversified uh, representation because uh, they have a, a comparative uh, compared to the previous generations of artists, they have a more focused artistic career, and that uh, and some of them like Luke view uh, uh, occupation as art instead of separating um, occupation and art. So overall, what do we find? So uh, so actually, it is a continuous. Uh, it is still ongoing. Um, period one artists benefited period two, and period two artists uh, benefited period three. So what do I mean by that? Because um, so let me give you an example. So uh, as I have just mentioned, Gaylord Chen is one of the period one artists, right? And he actually has a uh, an award that he would give out in the, at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. And one of our uh, period three artists, Kong Zhen Hei, actually got that award. So it is so interesting to see how act how uh, artists connect over the years and how did they support each other over the years. So uh, it is our hope that this trend can go on, uh, like to and to uh, provide more support for the future generations of artists. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Polly and this is Ocean. Our research traces the evolution of a community art project that is disseminated through the medium of a newspaper. In 2003, a key Chinese newspaper in Hong Kong named Ming Pao, Ming Bao, uh, launched a briefly a uh, feature session titled Sunday Life, Thinking Yat Sunwood. The session features a community-based art projects that foreground readers' participation. Sunday Life, has by now been running for two decades. This attests to the ability to strike a chord with its readers by shedding light on the political and social um, issues at stake in Hong Kong at different moments in time. Among the local artists chosen for Sunday Life, we decided to focus our research on the artist Bak Shangchu, otherwise known as Tozer. As he was the one artist, he was involved, so Tozer. He was one artist <laughs> who was involved in the project right from the beginning. Tosa came to Hong Kong from mainland China at the age of seven. As an artist, he has won multiple awards and was chosen to represent Hong Kong at the Venice Biennale in 2009. Tosa's community art in Sunday Life brings to the fore the notion of dissemination and um, chance encounter. We argue that because of his processual and relational qualities, his art is unarchivable and cannot be documented by using the traditional model of a linear timeline. So when we brought up this subject of archivability during our interview with Tosa, he drew our attention to this article published in Sunday Life on the 26th of March last year. He also introduced us to David, this man in the <laughs> photo, <laughs> who we, we would later interview. And now, let us share with you David's story. So the story 
is、uh, it started in 2005 when David was only a primary school student. At the time, he had never met Tosa, and neither did he knew that Tosa was an up-and-coming artist who would, from time to time, publish his artworks in Mingbao. One day, Tosa Tosa was like as usual, roaming around the city looking for ideas. As he was waiting for a bus at a bus stop, he found himself staring at a string of bus numbers printed at the top of the bus stand. The eight digits read like a Hong Kong mobile phone number. So an idea sprang to his mind. He would call the number and just see what happened. And here is a recording of the phone conversation. Identified this man at the other end of the line as Mr. Bus. He published a story on this encounter in Mingbo, using Mr. Bus as the title for his project. So this is actually the original of the Sinkhe、um, Yap, the, 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 the weekly、Something、session,、like、which was、uh, we borrowed from Asia、uh, Archive in Hong Kong. Back then,、um, David's family. Was a subscriber to Mingbo. Each day after reading the newspaper, David's grandmother would use it as a tablecloth to set the dinner table. So on that day, while having dinner with his family, David caught sight of this Mr. Bus story, and driven by curiosity, David dialed the number. And guess what? Mr. Bus,、uh, Mr. Bus answered the phone. Surprised, he hung up. David hung up as he simply didn't know what to say. So after that, Tosa, Mr. Bus, David continued to live their separate lives. In 2014, the Umbrella Movement took place in Hong Kong. Overshadowed by a sense of frustration and disorientation, Tosa revisited his previous art projects, and he decided to call Mr. Bus again and arrange to meet up this time. And so Mr. Bus met with Tosa in person for the first time. The, the reunion was later published in Main Pal. So this is the original copy. <laughs> As a keepsake of their unusual friendship, they also took a picture,、uh, took a photo at a sub subway station. So by co coincidence, the photo captures David <laughs> as he was on his way to work. By then. <laughs> David has already graduated from university, and he has become a computer engineer. So, in 2021, Amplus opened in Hong Kong. Among the Hong Kong artworks showcased in the museum was Tosa's Mr. Bus project, including this photo. Like many other Hong Kong art lovers, David was really excited when he visited the museum for the first time. But he was completely taken by surprise when he recognized his younger self <laughs> in the photo. Because of this surprising discovery, David later decided to participate in a community art workshop run by Tosa. And after the workshop, he walked up to Tosa and told him what happened. What happened after he read his Mr. Bus article all those years ago in 2005? So David told us that Tosa's Mr. Bus project has inspired him to imagine new possibilities for the formation of human relationships. At the end of the interview. David shared with us his an an anecdote to his story. He said that he dialed Mr. Bus number in 2005 not only because of curiosity. Apparently, at the time, David's grandma was a devout Buddhist, and she kept a statue of the Bodhisattva of Compassion of Wan Yin at home. She told him that she had a dream after reading Mr. Bus story, and in her dream, she dialed the number, but the person at the other end of the line introduced herself as the Bodhisattva. Not Mr. Bus. <laughs> so David called a number to prove to her grandma that hers was nothing but a dream. So as David's story shows, Tozer's artworks have a perceptual quality. 
They start as an expectation of future human relationships. Such potentials elicit actions from participants to materialize the future yet to come. Of course, it takes a chance to befriend a stranger. A hit target implies many missed opportunities. Things can be out of control. Our hopes may not come true. In other words, reality often fails us. But bearing the risk of failure, people still choose to act and seek human bonding. As is obvious in the cases of Mr. Bass and David, the imagination of human relationships is performative. It transforms what is merely a possibility into something present and everlasting. With such an unpredictable nature, human relationships arising from the community art projects are beyond the reach of any timeline. David's relationship with the artist develops retrospectively. It starts from a spark of contingency, a future moment nested in the here and now, frozen in the photograph, back to a child's challenge to his grandmother's superstition. It has its own pace in a different logic to that of a timeline. Um, the relationship makes its own leaps of faith, like a slippery fish ready to escape from the clutches of time. However, for art history, the question remains, how can we archive these serendipities? We approach this question by debunking the word timeline. Conventionally, the word suggests linear progression, arrowing from the past to the future. It is a representation of how historical events occur, but its linearity effectively, effectively dissolves other directions, circular or discursive, into the blank background. These absent directions in a timeline equally contribute to the singularity of historical writing. But if the relationship between David, Mr. Buss, and Tozer can travel back in time, then we should consider an alternative to retrieve the lost possibilities. Why not use a time circle, or even a time broccoli? <laughs> we visualize what we imagined into something like this. The first time circle um, is the Sunday Life feature, around the early years of publication. Tozer joined in 2003. He himself is another time circle. In 2005, he published Mr. Bus, which inspired other publications and events, such as David's story. If one keeps zooming in, these individual stories are also time circles that have more stories to tell, which are beyond our reach. We imagine all the community art projects are um, that when all our community art projects are documented in this way, the whole graph will, be, will look like a fractal, an infinitely self-similar geometric shape. The self-replicating multitude highlights how imagined relationships have agency, which makes people materialize their expectation. It calls for a shift away from synchrony when all things are in the same time scale. Instead, our time broccoli presents an archive with different clocks ticking together. The unpredictable development of Tozer's artwork scares us to run wild. In contrast, the attempt to pinpoint human relationships in the timeline literally falls flat. By this, we, don't, we do not intend to negate the value of a timeline. As James Scott maintains, quote, the best way to appreciate how heroic this constriction of vision was is to notice what fell outside its field of vision. A timeline generates magical knowledge to construct richer narratives, but it is also a result of simplification with value judgment. Simply archiving these newspaper records risks the danger of seeing the trees for the forest. These mountain lines are suspended over the void. The void, too, is rimmed with memes. It represents other possibilities that die out, roads not trodden. It also represents the unforeseeable human relationships thriving upon the initial publication, which are meant to be experienced, not documented. While timeline can be handy, it is pervaded with an artificial sense of neatness that distorts the chaotic reality. By speculating other shapes of time, we hope to make some noise to challenge such distortion. As our presentation comes to an end, we have a final confession to make. Everything we tell you about David is all made up. After all, David's story started from a dream rooted in local belief. So why can't everything else also be part of the fiction? This fictional timeline resembles how Hong Kongers may experience the community art projects published in the fall. David is a phenomenon encapsulating different events that ensue the publication of Mr. Bus. Only a fiction, instead of a timeline, can reflect such diversity from the reality. Fundamentally, David's story reveals how a timeline betrays its attempts to capture. Human relationships buzz with multiple voices. Only when they wither does documentation register its urgency. Thank you. Thank you.
so the last one, so I'm there with us, and then we're running over time. But the last one is Ariel, who's going to be looking at textile arts and yarn, and fiber arts in Hong Kong. So over to you. Um, so as you can see from my uh, title, it's kind of similar to what Ocean and Polly previously mentioned regarding what, whether a timeline works in terms of Hong Kong art history. So it's called the timeline, but like a yarn ball, Hong Kong fiber arts in contemporary relationships. Um, just a thing to, uh, just a just quick note, when I refer to textile art or fiber art, I'm actually referring, uh, referring to the whole genre. So even though I may say textile art, I'm actually referring to the whole genre in itself. So I think the main biggest question to begin with would be what are my motivations? Why did I choose this particular medium to begin with? Um, and the first one is just the peculiar lack of textile presence in modern and contemporary art, especially in Hong Kong, where there's a rich textile making history. So as most of you may have known, um, Hong Kong was one of the major hubs for textile making, for example, your garments or designer brands. But however, um, not a lot of Hong Kong artists, or as we know of in record, actually just uh, try to make art in regards to this history. And the second one, which is the one that I am more interested in discovering and also researching about, is the rich history of cross cultures and debates on style and the borders of art, craft, and design. Um, and it is across cultures. For example, there are African kente cloths, there are shibori, uh, shibori from Japan, or just the embroidery or weaving workshops at the Forbidden City. So these rich history, but they all accumulate to not a lot of references in modern contemporary art when I personally like to refer to history when we make art and we talk about art. And particularly, I want us to, I want to read us an excerpt from, um, um, from a journal in the, uh, an art journal called uh, The Problem with Craft. And it says, the study of craft have been seated at the outskirts of the table of modern and contemporary art history, where ideas and issues occupy the center and where anxieties about labor run high. The modernist century, as the narrative goes, brought us to, brought us to radical gestures of de-skilling, of rejecting hand skill in favor of articulate concepts. And henceforth, there are, there are beginning debates on straddling the borders of art, craft, and design. And I also would like to mention a few of the more well-known tapestry and uh, textile art, art makers um, in the Western realm, such as you know, Faith Ringgold or um, the Barbanoff uh, Art Tapestry Schools, which in China, but it was late. It was discontinued, and also Grayson Perry with his famous uh, tapestries as well. But these artists, despite the fact that they are very fluent in that language, they are not regarded as a fiber artist, but they are regarded as contemporary artists instead. So what does it mean to be a fiber and a textile artist in the contemporary and modern realm? And the third one is finding value in, in deviating from conceptual art with craft-like qualities and cotillion Hong Kong art. Um, I think present um, in contemporary modern art in Hong Kong, we do have painters uh, and, and artists that practice in traditional mediums, but there are also artists such as Lu Ching who practice in more conceptual realm. However, in my personal opinion, I do think that there's a lack of other types of mediums, and I am eager to discover what is the history behind it. And finally, just personal interest, I would I aspire to become a textile artist, and as a person from Hong Kong, I want to know what I can do and what kind of messages and narratives I want to say. So these are the key motivations. And since we are in New York City, I thought it would be a great opportunity to bring up this exhibition back in 1969 at MoMA called Wall Hangings. And this was the time when people started to write about textile art in the contemporary modern realm. Um, but And I have to also note that um, a lot of these writings regarding fiber and textile art in art history, they come from more American contexts. And there, even though there are more, there are writings in Chinese and in other cultures, but it's not of the greater majority. And here, uh, just to quickly read an excerpt from uh, this uh, this very great book called String Felt Thread, The Hierarchy of Art and Pop in American Art by Alyssa Author. Uh, she mentioned uh, the only single review in the national uh, from this exhibition was in the National Art Press, and it was actually commissioned uh, from the sculptor Louise Bourgeois for the magazine Craft Horizons. And particularly, she said that it really liberated themselves from the declaration, which was a blow to the curators, given the per uh, pejorative connotations of the term decoration and the decorative as the opposite of art in the history of modernism. So, since the beginning of time, or since the beginning of this conversation. Fiber and textile art was not largely regarded as a contemporary or modern technique. And, and henceforth, I think there is an urgency to talk about what it means to create modern and contemporary art, especially in, uh, in the Hong Kong context, where not a lot of people are doing it. Um, so the easiest way to enter into understanding how contemporary and modern art begins, I thought it would just it would be easy to just visualize the his exhibition history, right? To see what are the exhibitions or artists who were doing at the time. And most, and I particularly have chosen um, the time, 
Let's see here. I particularly chose uh, the time span from 2000 all the way to 2020. Um, it's very small right now, but um, the top section uh, is talking about the institutions in Hong Kong where they may have uh, uh, textile and fiber art exhibitions or featured significant pieces of this medium. And the middle section in, in light green features an art space, uh, like art spaces where maybe remote artists. And the last section is about galleries, where the galleries have held exhibitions that featured um, tapestry artists from uh, internationally or locally. And there are a few points I do like, I would like to highlight is um, the seeming legions of this gallery space in Polytechnic University in Hong Kong, which is famous for its fashion uh, education and design education. And because of its nature of a design school, um, we may, I personally neglected the fact that they do have a gallery and a museum. And actually, they have held multiple exhibitions, even, even touring exhibitions across the world regarding tapestries and fiber art. And you can see they have done an extensive job on it. And they even later on collaborated with the chat, with chat center, uh, center, of, center of heritage and art and textiles, I think, yes. um, which dedicates itself to textile making in Hong Kong because of its roots and, fund, and its funding from a textile company and now a real estate company. And you can see they have launched um, you know, artists and residence program and, and a crazy ton of uh, tapestry related or uh, contemporary modern, uh, modern exhibitions that features tapestry and um, uh, uh, textile and fiber art. And then when we scroll down a little bit, scroll a little bit downward, we can see this is actually Parasite. Um, and just to briefly mention what is Parasite, Parasite is, um, artist, was started as an artist work um, art space uh, in the 90s and then later become one of the most significant independent spaces to showcase art. And this was, uh, and the emergence or the use of tapestry and uh, of textile and fiber art only started or become more prevalent when uh, Cosmo Castinas was appointed as a parasite director. And you can see his curatorial practice has a lot of textile interests. And henceforth, um, some of the press and media even mentioned that this Koloa Woman Art and Technology was one of the first uh, textile, uh, modern and contemporary textile exhibitions in Hong Kong. Um, so, and, and you can see each of these exhibitions, despite the fact that they not they may not be textile and fiber centered, but they do feature at least one or a few pieces of textile art. And the last is just a quick re quick view of the other exhibitions international. Uh, they could be Sinsin Fine Art or Jock Bate Gallery and uh, and Whitestone Gallery, even that featured these tapestry artists. Uh, however, um, there are a lot of limitations in looking at this timeline, as we do, we don't see any schools, right? So, are students learning from learning tapestry or, or, or fiber or weaving at schools? And let me go back to my slide. There we go. And it is unable to show the community engagement and interactions that a lot of um, art, a lot of this kind of art medium does um, practice. And, and there, I think the last two questions is the question that I have uh, asked myself the most, would be where are the Hong Kong artists actively engaging in textiles at the time when we look at that specific timeline? And also, so what, right? <laughs> like, you looked at all these histories, and what does it bring, and what does it tell us? So um, to answer these questions, I think the best way to do it would be asking people. And henceforth, I have interviewed five uh, artists who are, who are coincidentally all women. And they are kind of organized in this order because let's start with uh, Stella Tang. She actually did um, a fabric uh, exhibition back in, from 2003 and 2009, and then she discontinued it. So she stopped doing this and she focused mainly on oil painting. And we have Angela Su, who is great, uh, who is uh, famous for her hair embroidery pieces. And we have some Jeff Lam, who actually works in a lot of sculptural works, but she, uh, she also significantly works with fabric and collages and also these quilts. And we have Eastman Chen, who is more active later in the 2010s. And she does a lot of sewing and also playing with fibers. And lastly, Ike Chen, who was more active in the 2010s as well, where she did a lot of soft sculptures. So from just this brief preview of what they practice, it's a great variety of different things. But also, they're not the ones that we're quite familiar with the Western realm. Because these are not tapestries. These are maybe, they could be smaller works. They could, then they're kind of abstract, but at the same time, they have regret, have, they have a close narrative to Hong Kong culture as well. And what I mean by that would be, what I mean by that is they, and I asked these questions when I was interviewing them as well, or, or the general idea of these questions. Um, for example, what can the medium mean to artists ideologically and physically? 
and how does the tactile quality of the practice impact the work, and what Hong Kong stories can only be made or told through the textile fiber art, and why is that. And so from these conversations, I talked to them for hours, and I even talked to Ivan for four hours, <laughs> just on to these subjects. And later on, what I realized is that, you know, the linear timeline that you just looked at, absolutely useless in a way. It doesn't give me a lot of information. And the most important thing is I spent so much time with them, right? They told me so many stories that I didn't know about, their, I, their struggles with dealing with this, fight, this thing, and then they don't know a lot about, they don't have school, that they, there's no teachers to teach them. So I wanted to visualize the interviews into a more, um, in a graph, in a sense, and also their experiences, and most importantly, their humanistic histories of what kind of stories they can tell, and that could be relevant to a Hong Kong art history. So which brings us to this um, map right here. And a way to look at it um, is the teal is actually the names of the artists, and the orange ones are the mediums or the, the methods that they use and ideas that they have. And they're scattered around, there's some of the purpley blue ones, they're places that they have worked at or they've exhibited that. And finally, there's also, uh, let's actually pause there and start from there. <laughs> you can see um, the middle section where they kind of draw a shared space is where they're mostly interacted with. And, the, and compared to other maybe cluster graphs that you have seen in pre previous um, presentations, these notes that I have named are very personal and subjective. For example, it would be a word that they say during the interview, or some ideas they have expressed, or some worries that they have when they were practicing this medium. For example, I don't think this caught on, but for example, they were saying their body aches, right? They cannot continue working in this medium anymore, and because their body cannot take, take they, their body simply cannot do it anymore. And multiple, and a few of the artists actually share that same commonality and sentiment. And moreover, you can see, for example, the sewing is, an, is a method that a lot of um, artists use. And here you can say that he tr they try to express different, and they all try to express different um, subjects or ideology, uh, ideology through that specific medium and how they experiment with it. And so I'll talk about the Western cultural domination through her sewing and also cultural identity that I previously talked about with uh, heritage. And but however, we can also see how um, there are specific locations where people would have uh, multiple exhibitions regarding um, a textile. For example, Karen Weber actually held many multiple exhibitions that these artists have also shown in to show um, you know, the art galleries are actually also involved. Um, and also, I wanted to highlight um, another thing that was kind of unique was the community involvement that they were all engaged with in this medium. I think this is kind of unique because uh, as I was reading about how textile and fiber art was used in the Western world and American context, a lot of them had to do with feminist narratives, but this is actually absent from the Hong Kong art history, where that was not an urgent, there was no urgency to talk about that through this medium. Instead, they were actively involved in community work, engaging with the public, which was kind of unique in the Hong Kong narrative sense. So that is something that I might be interested in to, uh, to develop in the future. So. And so these are, and you can, we can go on forever with the custom crop to be fair, but I think one of the two things, two main things that I took, that I really gained from this is the mapping of relationships and the ecology of marginalized groups and practice in Hong Kong art history and how they interact with each other and nothing is linear because it's like a yarn ball, like I previously had, um, like that, put it in a metaphor. And the, and this traditional methods of using maybe exhibition history or cause and effect social economic and social political influences and these kind of traditional mythology in art history do not work when we try to trace art history with a single medium that's more marginalized. So finally, it would be what's next? Or what do we do with this information? I think, per, I think there needs to be some sort of a language to communicate what relationships are in a contemporary sense. Instead of doing things linearly, do we conduct more interviews? Do we create an archive of people experiences and encounters through this medium? And what are the more heartfelt and tactile qualities that this medium could provide and a deeper look into our history? So this is the end. If you have questions, please do ask. And thank you. We do have time for so a couple of questions, so I do understand we have ran over time. So just a couple, Colleen. Sure. Oh, well, uh, this is a question for any of the students. Um, first of all, thank you guys so much. I feel like I learned so much from the presentations and also uh, just being you know, uh, in community with you for the last few days. I guess what I was the most um, impressed by was like the sophistication 
of the presentation uh, formats and technologies, uh, you know, ranging from like a kind of more traditional bound publication to the cluster graphs. So my question is, you know, how did you come to these different formats for, present for like presenting your final project? Did you work with like a digital lab or a team? Uh, on those kind of technologies that I have no idea how to do. Um, and also, you know, how the format informed the type of research you made. I guess Ariel gestured towards like what actually cannot be expressed in a cluster graph. So I want to hear about, you know, how your decision of the format kind of changed or shaped the type of research you were doing. You would like to pick that one up. Some of you change, uh, some of you did change. You started with one kind of timeline. Everyone started with a linear timeline and then it all changed. <laughs> <laughs> so who would like to pick that one up? Aaron, do you want to pick that up since it was for me? I think us? for me, just when I talk to the artists, like they have so much to say, how do you get them in a more visible and natural way so that people who are not familiar with how the is also, uh, they're also capable of comprehending, of comprehending it. And so that's why, well, thanks to um, Dr. Kuhn and also Oski from Page Art Archives, who has introduced us to the beautiful mechanism called a Graph Commons. And then we experimented with it. We figured out what kind of ways we want to represent our different um, timelines. And then later on, developed into what it is today. So, But for sure, I feel like there's more work to it. I feel like there's also a third timeline that could come up, right? You know, we never know. But it really was an AJR archive. Mm -hmm. uh, working with Oscar, who is the program uh, director there, she actually introduced students to the classic graph because she was more kind of. So, apart from these students, and also there were other, other people from AJR archive, who was also part of this workshop, and she did a really interesting one was uh, looking at relationship with artists, and she introduced students to the that. And it became a really useful one to kind of map different kinds of relationships that that is impossible to do through a timeline, which is much more event based. So how would you do relationships and a kind of relationship? So that became a good one to do that. But there are, I think also, I, um, maybe Polly or, or, um, or Ocean will talk about, because they, you guys also did something. They were like, we don't want to do timelines. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so um, because when we are discussing this with the artists and when we are doing the very massive um, archival research, because Ningbo has published for 20, 20 years, and then there are over a thousand issues, and then we figure that maybe it's not a fast way to just simply put them in a linear timeline, especially because of the nature of such publications. Um, and then also thanks to Dr. Kuhn, who also proposed the idea of making a fiction out of this whole story and then just pick out single cases instead of presenting a very overwhelming database to you all, um, which can present the data, um, which can um, pinpoint some time points, um, but at the same time also just to um, present how it's impossible even to um, just to document these thoughts in a linear form of timeline. Um, and then also thanks to Alsi um, from Asia Art Archive, because we realized when she is introducing us to uh, Graph Commons, this method that, most, uh, that many of us have used, we actually see that um, Polly and I actually realized maybe it's a way for us to visualize time beyond a linear form. So yeah, that's how we get to this. We didn't show the full range of what the cluster graph can do, but one of the things it does is actually shows relationships. So you get the big dots, and then you may have ones which are far away, which actually shows how did the distance, how far away it is. So the distance in the where the dots are placed will also show the scale of the relationship too, which was actually very useful, um, especially with uh, a lot of the um, galleries and things. That was also kind of useful to see who connected with whom, and it was a really interesting way of cutting it together. Um, questions? I, I think we have to end it here. Yeah, so unfortunately, I think we do have to do that. Thank, 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 thank you, everyone, for the questions. Thank you. 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 Thank you.